majestic, dramatic, or inspiring. These are the bridges that are worldwide icons, as well as engineering marvels. She's beautiful. Each of them broke new ground. The first, the biggest, the longest, and the tallest. I'm Rob Bell, an engineer, and I'm on a global adventure to discover how and why these magnificent structures were built, and to learn about the sweat and the sacrifice that went into their construction. Oh, hey! I'm going to take you closer to them than ever before. Oh, this is magnificent. Inspect them from every conceivable angle. Oh, yeah. And meet the men and women who keep them going around the clock, no matter what. <laughs> These are the world's greatest bridges. The Tarn Valley in the south of France, a magnet for tourists. For centuries, they've come here in their hundreds of thousands, drawn by its outstanding beauty, history, and culture. Now there's another reason people flock here. This, the Mio Viaduct. It's arguably the most beautiful bridge in the world. But it has another claim to fame that's beyond any argument. This is the world's tallest bridge. At 343 meters high, this 290,000 ton steel and concrete structure is a marvel of modern engineering. It stretches 2,460 meters, or just over one and a half miles, between two limestone plateaus crossing the Tarn Gorge. This has to be the perfect way to see it as it stretches out over this beautiful landscape. And the roadway, which is often completely lost in the cloud, is over 250 metres above the River Tarn below. Opened in 2004, it carries four lanes of traffic held up by 1,500 tonnes of steel cable. These are attached to seven elegant pylons that soar above. Look at this. <laughs> As you approach the bridge, all the traffic just naturally slows slightly. Everybody's taking this in. This is incredible. I wish I wasn't driving. I just want to keep looking out the window. Although it can be seen from miles all around, it's only when you get up on the bridge, on the deck here where I am now, you get a true sense of its monumental scale. The height of the pylons here, the width of the pylons, and the length of these cables. It's truly impressive. The bridge was built to combat severe traffic congestion. Every holiday season, Parisians decamped to the south of France, traveling along the A75 motorway. It was a straightforward journey until they reached the Tarn Gorge and the small, winding roads that crossed it. The old route across the valley would typically take about an hour and a half, but that's on a good day. At peak times, traffic jams could add an extra five hours onto the journey. Before the Mio Viaduct, one of the main crossing points across the River Tarn was here in the town of Mio, where a bridge has stood since the Middle Ages. The first was destroyed in a flood, and this, the Le Rouge Bridge, was built to replace it in 1821. But, as you can see, it only allows for a single lane of traffic in each direction. Whilst that was fine in the 1800s, it was wholly inadequate for the 21st century. Even the addition of this new and rather unremarkable road bridge did little to ease the miles of queues caused by modern day traffic. The solution was to build a bridge right across the entire gorge, from one side to the other, completely bypassing the town below. 
but spanning a gorge that's 600 metres deep and two and a half kilometres across presented a huge challenge which was not only technical but also aesthetic. Any modern bridge would have to complement the natural landscape and the many medieval castles and chateaus that dot it. For most, the challenge was simply too daunting, but not for French structural engineer Michel Viologeur. He'd already designed over a hundred bridges, including this, the Pont de Normandie over the River Seine. When it opened in 1995, it was the longest cable-stayed bridge in the world. Michel Viologeur's reputation for building bridges was second to none. But in 1989, when he first submitted his idea for a cable stay bridge across the Tarn Valley, the French government of the day didn't take him seriously. It was only after the success of his Normandy Bridge that the French Transport Agency decided to look at his plan once again. And what a plan it was. It would be one of the most ambitious engineering projects in modern history and result in a spectacular bridge across one of Europe's deepest gorges. Hello, Robert. Good morning. How are you? Very well. This is some view from up here, though, isn't ah, it's it? It's a very nice view, especially on this side in the morning. Initially, was to make a very slender bridge to keep a very large transparency on the valley. Yes. And so it had to be a cable state bridge because the cables are the best structures you can have to make a slender structure. We received from the local engineer a, a big drawing. It was a three or four meter long of the cross section of the valley. You see, we put it on the wall of our meeting room. And then I take a big marker and I started four pylons, five pylons, six pylons, seven. These hastily drawn plans formed the basis for one of the masterpieces of 21st century engineering. Seven piers would stretch two and a half kilometers across the valley. The road deck would be 270 meters high at the deepest part of the gorge, onto which pylons would be attached, soaring 87 meters into the sky. 77 pairs of cables would support the deck in an elegant cable stayed design. Michel Verlogeux's plans to bridge the Tarn were undoubtedly bold and ambitious and exciting, but they were also controversial. So controversial that before work began, the French Ministry of Transport once again had second thoughts. The Mio Viaduct, rising to an incredible 343 meters, is the tallest bridge in the world. This cable stayed bridge has seven elegant piers supporting the road deck, pylons, and cables. It is an engineering marvel. Building it across a two and a half kilometer wide gorge was fraught with technical obstacles. And placing it in an area of outstanding natural beauty was to prove to be an additional aesthetic challenge. When the plans for the bridge were first announced, environmental campaigners swung into action. They feared it would spoil the spectacular surroundings and even threaten the local way of life. Plans for the bridge had run into strong opposition from environmentalists and local residents. And Cetra, the French government transport agency, was anxious about the political fallout that would result from anything that spoilt this beautiful landscape. The solution? The bridge itself would have to be beautiful. France's most eminent bridge builder, Michel Virlogeux, planned for the building of the bridge to be as environmentally friendly as possible. But what the French government now wanted was an architect who would make it beautiful, turning something functional into a work of art, and they were prepared to search far and wide. It was necessary to make a kind of competition with great names to promote the bridge and to have a chance to, to, to build the bridge. 
One of the great names invited to bid was Sir, now Lord Norman Foster, one of Britain's most successful architects. He'd already given the world some of its most famous and iconic structures, including London's Gherkin, Wembley Stadium, the Reichstag building in Berlin, and one of the world's largest airport terminals in Hong Kong. I found myself in a very humbling situation when we presented our proposals because the engineers asked me to present the concept to the jury in Mio. And I think we were the only team where the architect actually presented the concept. Of course, that led to most of the interview being about the technicalities, which only the engineers could address. But, but in terms of establishing the principles, the idea that this was a bridge that was going to march across this plateau, and it would march nobly, heroically, um, uh, that was a shared philosophical design decision, which completely cut across the boundaries of architecture and engineering. Working together with engineer Michel Virogeur, their Anglo-French plan beat the other contenders. They convinced the competition jury their bridge would blend seamlessly with the surrounding landscape and even enhance the natural beauty. They envisaged an unforgettable experience for all those who crossed it. And as you drive across that bridge, it is like flying, it's like flight. And the idea that it's on a 20-kilometer radius gives it this curve. So it's a kinetic experience. When you're driving, you have a reference, and it changes. Construction on the Mio viaduct finally began in 2001. The task was to build a bridge that would span the Tarn Gorge two and a half kilometers from one side to the other, bypassing the town completely. On paper, this ambitious bridge design would work, but it would push what was conventional bridge engineering to new heights. 343 meters high, to be precise. And building it would require groundbreaking innovation. So really, it's not surprising that this is now considered one of the greatest engineering achievements of modern times. The first challenge was to build the seven piers. Because of the depth of the valley, they would be the world's tallest. And because the depth of the valley changes over its width, the length of the piers would also vary for the road deck to remain at a level height. Those piers are made of reinforced concrete. They had to be strong enough to support the colossal weight of the decks, pylons and cables, not to mention the traffic. Strength here was key, but so were the all-important design features. Norman Foster had amended the original design from seven straight piers to tapered piers, shaped like obelisks. Just a few simple strokes on paper but a significant engineering challenge in reality. To build the tapered piers, 53,000 cubic meters of concrete had to be poured into specially designed molds that allowed the piers to narrow as they grew taller. And the molds had to be changed for every four meters in height, a staggering 250 times in total. So much concrete was used in building the piers that a factory was specially built on site to service the demand. Everything about this bridge is on a monumental scale. 16,000 steel bars were used to reinforce the concrete in the piers. Now, if you were to lay those all out end to end, they'd stretch from here, Mule, 4,000 kilometers into Central Africa. All seven massive piers were constructed simultaneously. But in early 2002, as they rose into the sky, there was a near disaster. A landslide very nearly knocked pier number one down. As stunning as it is, building any bridge in this spectacular landscape was never going to be easy. The Tarn Valley is in an area called Les Grandes Cousses. Cousses coming from the old French word cou 
meaning lime. And one of those limestone caves is just down here. Here we go. The sheer number of caves in the region can make certain areas of the ground here unstable. Yet another challenge for the design and construction teams of the bridge. The geological formations uncovered after the landslide were something that took even local caving experts by surprise. When they built pylon number one, they didn't know that there was one cave beneath it. And that's why it caused this landslide, because there are some caves that have not been mapped, and the one below P1 had not been discovered yet. The only reason why it broke down was because there was lots of vibration due to the construction. But outside of the construction of the bridge, there has never been a landslide here. Why are there so many caves throughout this whole area of France? It's because the rock that makes this area, called the Larzac, is very porous. It's a rock of dolomite, which originally was a coral reef that fossilized about 160 million years ago. And coral, so... Yeah, coral. Well, this was at the bottom of the sea, then, where we are? Yeah, back in the Jurassic, when dinosaurs from the Earth, this was the ocean. Ha! Huh. And then the plates pushed this part of France up. When the coral went above the surface, it died and fossilized. And that's why there are so many holes in this rock of dolomites. And that's why the rivers were able to flow through them and destroy the rock. To prevent further landslides, the sides of the valley were shored up with tons of concrete, and work continued uninterrupted. The big challenge in constructing the seven piers right across the gorge was to ensure that the tops of them were in the exact positions they needed to be, so the deck would comfortably sit on top. Any compromise in that accuracy, and they'd risk that when the deck was launched out from each side of the gorge, they might not meet in the middle. If the pier casts were just 10 centimetres out on a four-metre section at the bottom, that could have resulted in being a huge six metres out of place at the top. Each pier had to reach a particular point in the sky. The team employed satellite positioning technology to make sure the exact heights were reached. It took 14 months. They completed their task, and it's difficult to overstate their accomplishment. They'd built the highest pier in the world in one of the deepest gorges in Europe. This is pier number two, and it's the tallest of all the towers supporting the bridge. Now, from its base, just to the bottom of the deck there, is 245 metres. I don't think I've ever been made to feel the way I'm feeling now by a piece of civil engineering before. This is truly spectacular. I've been given privileged access to the top of pier number two. But to get there, I'll have to go inside the road deck, beneath the four lanes of traffic using the bridge. There's not much room down here. This is brilliant. OK. Wow, look at that view. <laughs> Spectacular. This is unbelievable. And the views out across the landscape. Oh, just amazing, let alone the view I've got behind me. Getting to see this bridge from all of its angles, but this one is unique. This is Pier 2. It's the tallest of all the piers. And you're so far off the ground. And you can see as the pier gets higher and moves away from the ground, it splits into two. So I'm over here on one half and you're over there on the other. Now, that adds to the aesthetics of this bridge with its, its slim lines. But primarily, this split is here for crucial engineering purposes. The deck is fixed on the piers. It's not moving independently. And when the deck moves, the piers follow the movement. Yes, 
It gives more flexibility. If the piers were full of concrete, we could have less flexibility. But doubling it makes it more flexible. Because the deck is made of metal, it can extend and contract with the temperature. When it's warm, it will extend, and when it's cold, it contracts. It's just so bizarre to be sat, perched right on top of something so enormous, made out of concrete, that's up here in the middle of the valley, very slowly and gradually moving about. That <laughs> seems very strange. As impressive as the construction of these massive piers was, the most difficult phase of this epic build was still to come. For their next challenge, the team would have to fix the 36,000 tonnes of steel deck on top. Laying the deck on which that road sits took some extraordinary imagination, a great deal of technical know-how and a heck of a lot of patience. We're giving you the chance to head stateside to visit not one, but two of the world's greatest bridges which feature in the series. You and a friend will head to New York for a three-night stay at Archer Hotel in Manhattan. Whilst there, take a Circle Line cruise sailing under the incredible engineering mammoth, the Brooklyn Bridge. Then jet to San Francisco for a further two nights on the doorstep of the Golden Gate Bridge, staying at Cavallo Point Lodge in Sausalito. A visit is the ultimate way to appreciate these architectural giants. So to enter, text BRIDGE to 65515 or call 0904 16 15 577 or post your name and number to BRIDGE PO Box 7557 Derby DE10 NP. Texts cost £1.50 plus one message at standard network rate. Calls cost £1.50 plus your network access charge. Lines close at midday on the date shown on screen and three working days later for postal entries. For rules, go to channel5.com slash win. Opened in 2004, the Mio Viaduct is record-breaking. Not only is it the tallest bridge in the world, it also has the tallest pier in the world, an incredible 245 meters in height. The design team had been faced with a daunting task, to build a bridge that was environmentally minimal in design and yet was beautiful. British architect Lord Foster had been invited to add that beauty to the original design of French engineer Michel Villerogeux. Incredibly, at the very same time he was perfecting his plans for the Mio viaduct, Foster was also working on another revolutionary bridge project, one that was closer to home. But with this bridge, he'd run into an unexpected problem a problem that threatened to tarnish his reputation. In 1996, he'd won a competition to design a new crossing over the River Thames, the Millennium Bridge. The British authorities wanted it to open at the dawn of the new millennia. And like their French counterparts in Mio, they wanted it to be beautiful as well as functional. Whereas the Mio Viaduct was the world's tallest bridge, designed to blend into its rural landscape, the Port of London Authority demanded a low-profile bridge to blend into London's urban landscape and preserve the river views of St Paul's. By making it a suspension bridge, but perhaps the first of its kind, where it's not like Albert Bridge behind you, yep. rising into the air, which is one thing at Mir, that is the way to, for it to dissolve into the landscape. Here, to use the same device, it would have intruded into the landscape and it would have said, here I am, whereas really the bridge is saying, here is St Paul's. Lord Foster's radical design for the Millennium Bridge here took suspension bridges into new territory. It not only looks different to a conventional suspension bridge, it's technically different too. It's what's called a low-profile suspension bridge, and only a maximum of 11 metres in height across its 320-metre span. Take a look at a few of the world's other great suspension bridges, the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol. 
the Brooklyn Bridge in New York, or San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge. All their cables are above the deck and highly visible. Lord Foster's design for the Millennium Bridge was very different. The cables on the Millennium Bridge support arms running below the level of the deck, supporting it very much like a cradle. This gives the bridge its distinctive low profile. The cables transfer the weight of the bridge and everyone on it into these massive concrete foundations. The Millennium Bridge was a huge design success, delivering a bridge that was iconic, beautiful, but still protected the river views. When the bridge opened on the 10th of June 2000, it was a huge hit with the public. 80,000 people turned up to cross, with as many as 2,000 crammed on it at the same time. But there was a problem. The bridge wobbled uncontrollably. Just three days later, it had to be closed. When I heard it, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I was absolutely devastated. Wobbly bridges aren't uncommon. This is the Albert Bridge, which was originally built here across the Thames in 1873 as a modified cable stayed bridge. Engineers have known for years that the rhythm of walking can be harmful to a bridge. This sign here orders troops to break step as they cross, because marching in unison can cause vibrations which can damage the structure. And in 19th century France, a bridge even collapsed as troops marched across. The danger arises because of a well-known phenomenon called mechanical resonance. It's the frequency at which any structure, in this case a bridge, wants to naturally vibrate at. In general, the stability of a bridge is affected by two main factors. There's the movement and vibration caused by the wind, and there's the vibration caused by the load moving across the bridge. In this case, it's people walking across. But this was bridge wobble with a difference. Rather than the conventional up and down vibration, the Millennium Bridge wobbled from side to side. What happened here on the Millennium Bridge is that as people walked across, it caused the bridge to vibrate, to rock slightly from side to side. That, in turn, changed the way people walked across. Instead of walking normally, it meant people subconsciously started to widen their gait slightly to counteract the movement of the bridge, almost like they were ice skating their way across. That, in turn, moved the bridge and made it vibrate even more, and the whole thing snowballed until the bridge was wobbling seemingly out of control. Although the bridge didn't present a serious danger, the wobbling had to be fixed. The engineering teams fitted 91 dampeners along the length of the bridge. These work rather like shock absorbers on a car, soaking up the vibrations. By February 2002, the bridge was open again, working and looking just as its designer had always planned. Of course, it was traumatic and embarrassing, um, but the feedback has changed the legislation. So that has been positive, and that is the story of, of buildings and structures. With the Thames crossing reopened and Lord Foster's reputation still intact, he was now able to concentrate on something far more spectacular, the Mio viaduct. And getting this right was now his greatest challenge. All the longest bridges in the world are suspension bridges, using cables to take the weight of the deck down to the foundations. But to cross the two and a half kilometers of the Tarn Gorge, a cable state design was chosen for the Mio viaduct. Now, suspension bridges and cable stay bridges do look similar in that you've got a bridge deck between two tall towers supported by a load of cables, but technically they work differently. First of all, on a cable stay bridge, you do away with your main suspension cables. 
much. You forgive the crudeness of my model here. With a cable stayed bridge, you still have your deck supported by cables running from tall towers. But here, we don't need those large suspension cables. And you get that characteristic pattern of those diagonal cable stays running down seemingly from the sky, holding your bridge up. The benefit of the cable stayed bridge was that it could be slender and beautiful, allowing the Mio viaduct to blend into the landscape. The viaduct may be ultra modern, but the basic design concept was first mooted in this remarkable old document. A book called Machinae Novae, written by Fausti Varanti, published around 1595. It depicts some remarkable innovations <laughs> of all different kinds, including some very forward-thinking designs for bridges of all varieties. There's this wooden, simple wooden beam bridge here, an arch bridge. He even foresaw the cabled stay bridge, a good 200 years before the first one was ever built. Just wonder what Fausti would have made of the Mio viaduct today. The Mio viaduct was to bring bridge design into the 21st century. And it was 21st century technology that would be required to make this groundbreaking design a reality. 14 months into the build, seven piers had successfully been completed. Now the second phase of the build could begin, putting the 36,000 tons of steel deck on top of them. The steel deck is made up of 2,200 sections, each weighing 90 tons. To minimize the environmental effects on the local area, the sections were made off-site nearly 1,000 kilometers away in Lauterbourg, northern France. Convoys then transported them here, each having to negotiate the narrow roads and small medieval towns and villages to Mio. Traditionally, a bridge deck is lifted into position, but the sheer height of the piers and the high winds in the Tarn Valley meant it was impossible to do this safely. This was the test how to launch the deck right out over the valley, where at points it was 245 metres down to the ground below. Simply pushing it from behind could risk a collision with the tops of the piers. What was needed was innovation. They devised a special jack mechanism that used wedges. And I'll show you what I mean on this very simplified model here. If you imagine this is my bridge deck here, and here I have two wedges. This is my, my jack, my launching jack. Now, the bridge deck placed on top there. If I push this top wedge from the side, as those two inclined surfaces there of the bottom and the top wedge slide across each other, the bridge deck gets lifted up. And on the bridge itself and the jacks they were using up there, that lift was only two centimetres. And then the deck, using another set of hydraulic pistons, pushed the deck out. And it would push it out 60 centimetres at a time before the wedge, the top wedge, was then pulled back again. The bridge deck lowered onto its supports before the whole mechanism could start again. And by repeating this cycle over a period of 14 months, the decks were safely pushed out over the valley, avoiding any collision with the tall vertical piers. Finally, on the 28th of May, 2004, both sections of the deck met. The Tarn Valley had been bridged. For the great and good of France, there were celebrations. For the engineers and the British designer, there was relief and a continuing satisfaction. I'm very happy, yes, yes. And I'm proud to be part of the team that, that created it. And that's a big team. And processes had to be invented 
to enable that bridge. The idea of sliding out these great cantilevers and, um, and finally it meets in the middle. Amidst the celebrations, the team knew there were further challenges ahead. Not least, how to suspend 1,500 tonnes of steel cables from pylons that reach higher than France's most famous structure, the Eiffel Tower. Remember, there's still the chance to win that trip to the States, giving you the opportunity to admire the Brooklyn Bridge in New York and the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco from the ground up. So to enter, text BRIDGE to 65515 or call 0904 16 15 577 or post your name and phone number to BRIDGE, P.O. Box 7557, Derby, DE10NP. For rules, go to channel5.com forward slash win. Good luck. The Mio Viaduct the tallest bridge in the world and one of the biggest engineering achievements of modern times. Among its many outstanding features is the road deck. It's the highest in Europe at 270 meters. That's the equivalent of putting a four-lane highway on top of an 80-story skyscraper, then stretching it right across a two-and-a-half-kilometer gorge. In May 2004, with construction of the deck complete, the next challenge was to put up the enormous steel pylons, each weighing 700 tons. The Mule Bridge has been built with record-breaking feats of engineering. The pylons at 87 meters in height are the tallest in the world. The pylons, like the road deck, were made off-site and transported to Mio to lessen the environmental impact. They were positioned using a method perfected by the ancient Egyptians to raise obelisks. A hydraulic machine lifted each pylon between two temporary towers. As it did so, the pylon pivoted until it was vertical and then secured to the bridge deck. The entire length of the deck is supported by 77 pairs of cables. The cables extend out from the sides of the pylons up there, right down here, where they're locked and anchored into the place within the frame of the deck itself. Any wear or corrosion on these cables could spell disaster. 1,500 tons of steel cable are all that hold this impressive road deck from crashing into the valley floor. Routine checks are made to make sure the cables remain dry, both above and below the deck. When you walk along the passage here inside the deck, you come across these mechanisms every so often. These are where the cables come down from the pylons and are locked into place here on the deck. This is what's holding the deck up. Now, what's really important to understand is that when you look at the pylon and you have the cables coming out from each side, there are actually two separate cables on each side. There's this same mechanism up in the pylon locking that into place as well. So you get that diagonal cable locked on this end in the deck and locked on that, uh, that other end up high in the pylon. And if you look up behind me here, you can actually see the cables are exposed and you can see how many of them there are. Well, the reason they're actually exposed here is threefold. One, if it snaps, if any of those cables snaps, you'll be able to see it right here. Second is if there's any leaks from the deck up above. Again, you'll have water coming out down here. You'll know there's a problem up the top. And thirdly, because this whole area is dehumidified and the air is nice and dry, the fact that it's open down here means that that dehumidified air goes all the way up inside the sheath, around the cables, and into the pylon. Everything inside this bridge is dehumidified, keeping the steel nice and dry and keeping rust well at bay. In fact, it's not just the cables that are protected. Dehumidifiers provide the whole bridge with a controlled environment. This means that, unlike other bridges, the Mio viaduct doesn't need painting to prevent it from rusting. This will save a fortune in not having to paint it every five to ten years. 
This bridge was built to last, a minimum of 124 years to be precise. And it was designed to withstand anything the elements can throw at it. Now, I'm stood at the end of the deck here on the north side of the bridge. You can hear the cars rumbling across as they right above me here. The expansion joints that allow for the expansion and contraction of steel are common on many bridges. But between a really cold day and a really hot day here on this bridge, that deck can change its length by up to 1.8 metres. When I was here, the bridge moved 10 centimetres in just four hours. In fact, when the deck expands, the deck moves in a northerly direction and contracts in the opposite southerly direction. Yes, it's alive in a way. The bridge began its life on the 16th of December 2004. It had taken three years to complete and cost an estimated £272 million. For its French engineer, Michel Verlogeux, and British designer, Lord Foster, the opening of the bridge was the culmination of one of the most challenging and stressful projects in their careers. I remember going to visit the site, and I remember I was almost physically sick with anxiety. I was ill. And it was palpable relief. I mean, I was anxiety-ridden to the moment of coming round the bend and seeing the pylons and the cables and thinking, ah, what a relief. These pylons are the highest in the world. Even taller than another of France's iconic structures, the 324-metre-tall Eiffel Tower. This bridge at 343 metres is 19 metres taller. I've seen the bridge from all angles, but there's just one place that I know will top all the rest, the summit of the pylons. Right now, I'm partway across the bridge. I'm at the point where the valley is at its deepest. So I've got the tallest pier beneath me and the pylon right above me. And I'm heading up with Jay right on the top. Okay. <laughs> now, this is what all the work's been for, <laughs> getting up this height. Oh, wow. Oh, wait. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Check this out. Oh, wow. I'm going to take my hat off so it doesn't get blown away. <laughs> this is incredible. My God, the view from up here is just unbelievable. Even if I ignore the bridge for a second, there's nothing around you. But then you look out sideways. It's just this magnificent structure. Time and again, this bridge surprises me with how it makes me react to it. But I'm on the very, very top now of pylon and pier number two. So from here down to the river, the deepest point in the valley is, is hundreds of metres. Yeah, it's selfie time. The Mio viaduct is now more than a decade old. Built to ease severe traffic congestion caused by tourists, it has itself become a tourist attraction. It's so popular, it even has its own visitor centre. The initial fierce opposition to the bridge has now faded in the memory. It's more than an architectural triumph. For this region of France, it's brought financial and environmental benefits too. It's an economic generator, so that perhaps explains why, despite all the initial criticism, before it was built, it's now being embraced by the community. And you can catch that next week. Bethany Hughes is back after the break to reveal all about one of Britain's most fierce and fearless royals. Eight days that made Rome, Boudicca's revenge is new, next.